again, when it left uh, the, after this brief skirmish with uh, Stewart's cavalry at Haymarket, it ended kind of through Gainesville, got to Groveton, um, basically along Route 29, and turned left. What they came across was the old Second Manassas Battlefield. Now, we found this picture up in uh, Harper's Weekly. It shows uh, officers from the Second Corps that are observing the debris and whatnot that are still left on the battlefield. I mean, there were skeletons that had been uh, uh, visible. There were trash uh, recruitments from the equipment, old wagons and blown up limbers that, that existed along, along this particular trail. But when what Jim didn't mention was the fact that on the morning of the 25th, it started raining when the second corps backed away from there. And by the time it got to uh, the Manassas battlefield, it was in a heavy downpour. So what you got to have to uh, imagine are troops four abreast marching up that uh, Rofin Road, which is now Featherbed Lane, uh, on that dirt and gravel road. And as they're going across, uh, there was some gallows humor that sort of showed up. There was a, a skeleton, one New Jersey soldier said, he had his hand up this way and he said, look boys, the man's got his man hand out for back pay. <laughs> You love that line, don't you? <laughs> he loves telling me. Okay, here we go. We're back on and all right. In this area, early AM, June 26, per Hooker's own orders, he and his headquarters staff, and here they are, and there's Hooker, traveled up Hunter Mill Road on the way to Edwards Ferry, where he crossed, and then he went to Poolsville, Maryland, establishing his headquarters late in the morning. A uh, few of you might be familiar with this picture. Anyone have an idea who this fellow was here? He was the only one that was not with him because he was in Washington, D.C. begging for more troops for Hooker. That's Hooker's chief of staff, Daniel Butterfield. And anyone know what he did? He wrote taps. There he is, right here. See, I told you that would work. <laughs> anyway, uh, we have fun with this stuff because we've uh, gotten to know each other. So anyway, he comes right on up by Hunter Mill Road. Ironically, as Brian had mentioned earlier, Hooker ordered Second Vermont away from Wolf Run Shoals. 48 hours later, voila, on a secure Securitas route, here comes Stewart, first thing in the morning, crossing Wolfhorn Shoals with his entire command. And they very quickly run into a fairly significant skirmish just south of uh, Fairfax Courthouse with the 11th New York Cav, also called the Scots 900. Now, Stewart, they had too many men, they did beat him, and they beat him rather quickly. However, they lost a private major, a fellow by the name of John Whitaker, from the 1st North Carolina Cavalry. And the 1st North Carolina Cavalry was all over this area for the first two years of the war. Um, Stewart decided to halt for um, two or three hours to rest his men and let his horses eat, and quite frankly, eat grain. Because grain was the only thing that was really going to give those horses energy to continue. He also realized that this had been Hooker's last established headquarters because there was an am ample body of supplies and other prizes found in the village. Now, 1 p.m. on the 27th, it's today, Stewart started riding up Hunter Mill Road with his command. Anybody see any dust on Hunter Mill today coming up? Do you hear any horses? Because we're talking close to four, forty-five hundred, five thousand 5,000 horses, plus he had guns, caissons, ambulance, the whole thing. They were coming up Hunter Mill Road to get it around 1 o'clock. And they were headed towards Rouser's Ford, which is at the end of Seneca Road. Ironically, both Hooker 
who came up Hunter Bill 30 hours late earlier and Stewart this uh, this trip or travel by both of these men would end disastrously. Hooker would resign the following day at 1 p.m. And again, I mentioned it earlier, Stewart would get to Gettysburg too late to be of any assistance to leave when he was needed the most. Let me pick up again now with the, with the second corps. Uh, they had left Thoroughfare Gap and had been ordered to Edwards Ferry. Uh, they, they camped at a place called Gum Spring. Now, it's called Arcola nowadays. That's a little off Little River Turnpike. And this uh, uh, map we found down here was actually a map from the Third Corps, which had been there for almost four or five days. Uh, and they were located in these, these two particular areas. But the Second Corps came into camp that night. It, had, it was going to get an additional brigade. Jim mentioned the brigade of General Hayes that was at Centerville. It had now been ordered to join the Second Corps. So the guy that ran the Second Corps out of Centerville was now working for General Hancock as his third brigade commander. At the same time, General French, the third brigade commander, was ordered to Harper's Ferry, and Alexander Hayes became the third division commander, and he ended up at Gettysburg there as a, as a division commander. Uh, we think that they probably were in this particular area as where their campsite had. The next morning, they took off, and this is some of the ge geographic areas that we picked up. A place called Farmwell, Farmwell Station in Frankville. Uh, they don't exist on maps anymore. Farmwell is Ryan. It was part of uh, Thomas Lee's uh, plantation, and it was also called Five Corners. And our, our, it's one of our detours that our, our booklet has to take you around because development has, has put uh, uh, the old routes a little bit difficult to, to follow. But you get up into, into Farmwell. When you follow this, you go up Ashburn Road. Farmwell Station is Ashburn. It's where the bike trail crosses uh, Ashburn Road. That's where they have the old set that's in there. That's uh, Ashburn, Ashburn Station. Once you pass uh, Ashburn Station, Ashburn Road used to connect with Leesburg Pike. But now, because of the new roads and whatnot, you can't see it. But that used to be called Frankville. It's now underneath the underpass, where, they, where you have to cross over uh, from Ashburn Road. You've got to make that little job to go over, over uh, Leesburg. If you try to Google this and try to find out more, you won't find Frankville. You'll find something called Mahala, Mahala Post Office, and then ultimately Ashburn Junction in about the 1930s, as it is it went through. Uh, once the Second Corps got here, uh, north of Frankville, uh, they followed this area across to a place called Elizabeth Mills and along Goose Creek, and we're almost up to the Potomac area. And what I want to talk about, this is the last stop on our, on our tour, is this is a sketch map that I put together that shows how the bridges were put across. Now, I mentioned that this area up here is actually the River Creek Golf Course, and this is Lansdowne Golf Course. It's around there. Hooker had decided that he wanted to have a bridge across the Potomac. He didn't know when he was going to have to use it. But on the 21st of June, that bridge there was put across. 1,350 feet long, 65 pontoons that was in there. And then, of course, on the 24th, when Lee decided to send his guys across the uh, Potomac, he had to get another bridge in. He ordered another bridge on the 25th, but they didn't have enough boats there to do it. So they brought them up from Washington, up through the CNO Canal, through the locks. And by 10.30 in the morning, they had enough boats to start from both sides. So somewhat of an engineering feat, within four hours, they had put this second uh, uh, bridge together. And they had troops going over it by 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, the other thing you have to understand, it's raining. You got 80 to 90,000 troops and animals and wagons that are, that are going in here and Jim's going to talk about the weather impact on here. But there was another small bridge to allow them to go between the north and the south, and they also put small bridges over the canal so they could get more and more people out to, that was sitting here. Uh, this is what we think the assembly area on one of these sides would probably look like. There were no pictures taken of this particular part of the, of the, of the Civil War in here, and the bridges probably look pretty much like this. Again, let's see. Remember what that bridge looked like. Yeah. <laughs> It wasn't straight, 
to remember that. Yeah. Okay. This is what the, the area looks like today. Take pictures taken very recently. Here's the Potomac River. That's going west. This is coming down towards D.C. And Goose Creek is right here. The bridges would have been located, the upper bridge would have been right here, just above the mouth of the Goose flowing into the uh, Potomac. And where I stood to take this picture is where the lower bridge would have been positioned. Here's the view that the Second Corps would have had um, across the uh, Potomac heading into Maryland on the day that they traveled. Um, and the view, this assembly area, is located today on the elbow of the holes number three and four on the Lansing on Great Norman Golf Course. Should anybody be out there in the near future? The golfers. However, you see how pretty these pictures are? This ain't what happened. Uh, the conditions were not like this. And it was not as placid or serene as what you're looking at right now. And this river was the final obstacle in our story to get across into the Maryland area. And of course, they went on to Gettysburg. But remember, we kept talking about rain beginning on the 25th, crossing the Manassas battlefield. It was boring. It turned into torrential rains. So we have sunstroke the first week of our trip, our march. These guys are dropping dead left and right. And they were dropping dead on Hunter Mill Road coming up that road. The last several days of this trip, they had to deal with downpours. So here you go. It's incredible what they had to endure. Uh, the Army's, Army of the Potomac's crossing also took place night and day. Remember that picture I just referred to with the pontoon bridge? Can you imagine crossing a river? And by this time, the river was two feet high, the normal. It was a swollen river with a very swift current, and we all know how the Potomac can get under those kind of conditions. And here are these guys trying to get across it. It's raining, mud, and by the way, there are just a few uh, men and animals, roughly 90,000 men, 5,000 plus wagons, and 50,000 plus animals. The back of the men, material and beasts, extended 20 miles. Now, imagine Tyson's Corner to Leesburg. There you go. That's what was crossing right here under those conditions after they had just gone through hell and they were dropping dead with the heat. And that's just trying to get to Gettysburg. Again, we the battle at the end of it. Uh, the bridges required constant attention by the engineers and the assembly areas obviously were muddy bogs and wagons sank up to their axles. And again, the night uh, crossings were particularly treacherous with every horse requiring personal attention because of the unstable flooring. Now, remember I said earlier today, 150 years ago, Stewart coming up this road, beginning at one o'clock. They reassembled at Drainsville. All three brigades came together late afternoon today. And an interesting parallel to what was going on here happened later tonight. And at this point in time, Hampton, the 1st Brigade, is just finishing crossing the Potomac at Rouser's Ford. And they have just sent Lieutenant Kennan, Stewart just sent him down the river because Hampton reported back, listen, we think we can get the men across, but there's no shot we can get the artillery or the ambulance across here. So he sent Lieutenant Cannon down the river one mile to check another potential ford. Cannon came back on his horse called Big Eminem. He was wasted. He said, there's no way we can get the artillery across there. So he made a decision to cross here. And by here, this is um, a mock-up of one of the uh, 
historical markers at the end of Seneca Road, and that is the only known drawing of Stewart crossing the Potomac. And I helped draw it, but <laughs> so it's fairly accurate. <laughs> <laughs> Seneca Road is, you know, where um, Edge Rainsville, where Georgetown Pike comes in Route 7? Uh, right behind it. If you turn on to Georgetown Pike, you make a left immediately. That's Seneca Road. And go all the way to the end, and you'll have two markers. They're companion markers. One details, Stuart, what happened on the 27th. This particular marker detailed what happened during the crossing. So, the crossing was so horrendous that Stuart, and now it took Stuart eight hours to cross the Potomac. That's how bad that crossing was. And it's very rocky there. It's a terrible ford. It's a local ford. Nobody wants to use it, but he had to. Upstream, the Army of the Potomac is crossing at Edwards Ferry, so he can't go there. He didn't want to go east down towards D.C. because that's where the federal troops are in the capital. He just doesn't want to mess with that. He's got to get to Pennsylvania to help you out. Anyway, his de facto chief of staff, Major Henry B. McClellan, said, quote, after the war, that no more difficult achievement was accomplished by the cavalry during the war than crossing that river that night. And that's the conditions these folks had to face. Even after all these hardships, Hooker's army completed its crossing only 24 hours after the last of Lee's infantry crossed, and the whole of it was in Maryland before Lee or Stewart knew that the crossing had even begun. Okay, just take a minute and read this. This fellow, Corporal Manley Stacy, he's in our second corps. <coughs> and here's what he recounted on that day, June 26, in the march from Gum Springs to Edwards Ferry. And uh, I'm not gonna beat this to death, but it was one of the roughest days he ever had. They pitched their tents when they finally got there at six o'clock. And they thought, okay, we're done. <laughs> That's not what happened. At 10 p.m., we were ordered to strike tents. In other words, let's pack it up. We're going over. So they start crossing around 10, 30, 11 p.m. That real crooked pontoon bridge, that's what they had to face at midnight. And after a long and tedious march through the thickest mud he had ever seen, and that pertained to, again, the torrential rains that they were facing. The last line you gotta love. After all this, they get across the river and they march uh, a little bit further up. And uh, the, the quote is, here we camp and I tell you, it took but a short time to lay out blankets and get to sleep. So, again, rain. Okay? Okay, this is the final slide. We're going to wrap it up right now. After crossing the river, and I'm going to go a little bit into the future just with some summary statements, because we've taken you on our journey now across Northern Virginia, and what these fellows had to endure just to get a Lost the river. And by the way, anybody know how many people were lost at Gettysburg? 51,000. So you can imagine they had to go through all this and then that occurred, but they weren't quite there yet. They had to get there from the Potomac River. It became even more arduous, more rigorous, just to get to Gettysburg. Meade replaced Hooker just three days before the Battle of Gettysburg. This is funny kind of quote, I think. When awakened at 3 a.m. on the 28th, which is exactly, ironically, the same time Stewart's command finished getting across Rouser's Ford, it was the exact same time Meade is awakened and he's given command of the Army of the Potomac he was not happy to hear that. And his quote was, I have been tried and condemned without a hearing 
and I suppose I shall have to go to the execution. After enduring freezing temperatures in the summer in Fredericksburg, the mud march in January, Chancellorville in May, and a severe weather that we've discussed tonight, these wet and tired soldiers were now ordered to endure forced marches to catch up with Bobby Lee. One example, our beloved Second Corps. On the 29th, they marched 32 miles. It was the longest march by any corps in the Army at that point in time. We talked about the Second Corps a little bit more. They fought in the wheat field. The wheat field was bloodbath. 30% casualties on the second day of Gettysburg. Seven out of 21,000 casualties engaged in battle. The Second Corps would lose 40% of their corps, 4,350 out of 10,500 engaged in battle at Gettysburg. Generals Hancock and Gibbon were seriously wounded. Lieutenant McCray, remember Tully, the artillerist in the Second Corps? He was one of only two artillery officers left standing after Pickett's charge. <coughs> Corporal Stacy, slide before, he survived the battle, but not the war. And finally, our Sergeant Jay Fairbanks, who was in 12th Corps, and came up here, I'm gonna bring the gun tonight and everything. He was wounded in a fight in Gettysburg. Um, he went down to the south with, uh, and uh, fought at Lookout Mountain, where he got shot in both hips. And he was out of action at that point in time. He sent him uh, to the hospital where he recovered. And he also, believe it or not, re-upped. He got 300 bucks for re-upping, so that's probably the reason he re-upped. Now, okay, he's done all this stuff. You think, okay, things are gonna calm down a little bit. No, 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 no. He goes down to the Battle of Atlanta with Sherman. Takes the Sherman's march to the sea, and then toward the end of the war, he marched with Sherman through the Carolinas, resulting in Confederate Joseph Johnston's surrender. Now this is after Lee had already surrendered at Appomattox, and that was truly the end of the war. After that, they came back up by way of Richmond, Union Army, that had to be interesting, coming through Richmond, and on the second day, he was in the Great Parade in Washington, D.C. He was one of the very few soldiers that mustered in in 1861 and survived the entire war. There's nothing better than walking or driving land, particularly at your leisure. What's really neat is that many of the roads, geographical features, and points of interest in our booklet are still intact. With that in mind, Brian and I would appreciate your consideration the acquisition of the book. But tonight it's $15, it's kind of event pricing. And finally, as a result of numerous requests to put the show on the road again and do another tour or two and go through this, we've updated things and we've decided we're gonna do it. Um, we don't have a date yet, it's gonna be when it's cooler. <laughs> <laughs> we're not gonna do this, the sunstroke program. Uh, it's going to be in the fall, and uh, it'll probably be seven hours, half hour going to and coming from Members Ferry, that kind of stuff. And about 30, it'll be $35 per seat. So we're going to do a bus tour. If you're interested in that, please sign up, give us your contact information, and we have a description of what the tour is going to be. And I finally, I, we hope this presentation has enriched your understanding and appreciation for the Gettysburg campaign. I'd like to personally thank every one of you for your time and interest in coming tonight. Uh, it's been a pleasure. So thank you.